Well, good morning, church. And um, well, given that we're starting our prayer challenge later on today, it, it seemed like a good moment to speak about prayer, funnily enough. Uh, and of course, prayer is a, is a vast, vast topic that I can't possibly hope to do justice to in one talk. But hey, let's see how we get on. And we've spoken a lot in the last couple of years about being and about wanting to become a church that is devoted to prayer, just as the early church is described. And we've talked about developing rhythms of prayer, both corporately and in our own lives. And that's something that certainly we're growing in and that we continue to grow in. And this prayer challenge is it's just another way of trying to spur us on in continuing to grow in prayer and to continue to develop healthy rhythms of prayer in our lives and, and in the church. So as I said, prayer is a vast topic. There are loads of different ways of praying. There are different purposes to prayer. So, you know, are we talking about focused prayer during a, 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 a quiet time? Or are we talking about the more general informal prayer that might go on throughout the day at any time? Are we talking about asking for things in prayer or spending time quietly listening to God? And the answer is yes, all of those things. Because prayer is multifaceted and it has many different layers. So here's something that I think is helpful that I read from Pete Gregg, who's written uh, many books on prayer and has spoken here at King's before. So he said, the great theologian Karl Barth said that prayer at its simplest is just asking. In fact, Jesus said we should ask the father who loves to give good gifts. At this initial level, prayer is a kid who wants a PlayStation. It's a soldier going into battle. It's a mother with a dark diagnosis in a hospital chapel. But at a slightly deeper level, asking gives way to listening. Slowly we still our souls and prayer becomes less transactional, more relational, more conversationally attentive. And then at its deepest level, prayer may move less often than we would like beyond conversation. It's not that we run out of words, but rather that they become unnecessary. Communication becomes communion. It's a baby asleep in her father's arms. It's an elderly couple sitting in deep, comfortable silence until at last the clocks stop. Gradually, there comes a profound awareness of God's presence. Eternity breaks in. It is a moment of becoming, and all those frantic prayers wrestling for a blessing give way to resting in the greatest blessing of all. Now, if that's what prayer is, well, I think we all want that, don't we? I think we would all want to get to that deeper level of prayer. So why then do we tend to give prayer so little attention in our lives? And I'm generalizing here, of course. I know that some of you really do pray, but I'm working on the assumption that the vast majority of us, and me included, can often feel a bit of a failure in prayer, that, that we don't pray enough or we don't pray deeply enough. Now, the question that I really want to address today is why pray? You know, as we come into this prayer challenge, well, why take this challenge? Why bother? Why pray at all? Why pray? But maybe we have to start by asking, why don't we pray? Why don't we pray? And some people might, of course, say it's time. It's just a time thing. I just don't I just don't have the time. I don't really buy that. You know, of course, I understand we all go through different seasons in life. Some are busier, some are less busy. But I don't really buy the time excuse because we will make time for what's important to us. So if we're not making time for prayer, well, it indicates that it's not actually that important to us. But why? Why would that be the case? When we are clearly commanded to pray, Jesus says, when you pray, he models a life of prayer for us. Why would something that's so important for Jesus not be important for his followers. Well, in his book, uh, A Praying Life, uh, Paul Miller describes a scene where he was on holiday with five of their six children. His wife was at home and she was looking after one of their daughters called Kim, who was autistic. And one of the results of the autism was that she couldn't speak in spite of many years of speech therapy. And here's what Paul Miller uh, says. He says, I noticed that our 14 year old daughter, Ashley, she was standing in front of the van, tense and quiet. When I asked her what was wrong, she said, I lost my contact lens. It's gone. I looked down with her at the forest floor, covered with leaves and twigs. There were a million little crevices for the lens to fall into and disappear. I said, Ashley, don't move. Let's pray. 
But before I could pray, she burst into tears. What good does it do? I've prayed for Kim to speak and she isn't speaking. Prayer was no mere formality for Ashley. She had taken God at his word and asked that he would let Kim speak. But nothing happened. Kim's muteness was testimony to a silent God. Prayer, it seemed, doesn't work. Few of us have Ashley's courage to articulate the quiet cynicism or spiritual weariness that develops in us when heartfelt prayer goes unanswered. We keep our doubts hidden even from ourselves because we don't want to sound like bad Christians. No reason to add shame to our cynicism and so our hearts shut down. Why don't we pray? Probably because at the heart of it, and to put it very bluntly, we don't really believe it makes a difference. And of course, there are all sorts of reasons for that, probably primarily disappointments that we've experienced in prayer. But we can very easily become cynical about prayer. And it might not be an obvious cynicism. You know, we still say the right things. We still say the Christian things. But it's a cynicism that can kind of lurk and swirl at the back of your mind, at the back of my mind. And that, that swirl of doubt and cynicism affects how we pray with a lack of power, a lack of conviction, wondering where God is. Are you even there? And you, you stumble through prayer or you don't know what to pray or you don't really want to pray at all. Or you work your way mechanically through a prayer list, but with a lack of life and power. And, and then you feel guilty. You know, there must be something wrong with me because other Christians surely don't have this problem praying. And so we give up after five minutes with a crushing sense of failure, and therefore we never make it to those deeper levels of prayer. And it's this cynicism that causes us to question when we hear about an answer to prayer or a healing. We sort of think, hmm, really? Is it really? Would, would that have happened anyway? Is it really prayer that made any difference? And it's this sense of cynicism and doubt that can then make us reluctant to pray for somebody else, to pray for somebody's healing, because, well, what if it doesn't work? What do we do with that? And so it seems easier and less exposing not to pray. I wonder if you can identify with any of that. And if you can't, bless you, bless you, keep doing what you're doing. But I suspect that many of us do recognise that in ourselves. So how do we counter that? How do we counter that cynicism, that doubt, that unbelief that can so hamper our prayer lives? How do we counter that? Well, we do it by choosing to believe the word of God, choosing to believe that what is in here is true. Because here's the thing, if we believe what it says in here about the virgin birth, uh, about miracles, about the fact that we are uh, created rather than random accidents, if we believe all of those things, why would we not believe what it says in here about prayer? So here's an example from Revelation chapter 8, verses 3 to 5. Another angel who had a golden censer came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar before the throne. The smoke of incense, together with the prayers of the saints, went up before God from the angel's hand. And then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar and hurled it on the earth. And there came peals of thunder, rumbling flashes of lightning and an earthquake. Now, that section of Revelation I just read, it's in the context of the final judgment. And of course, because it's in the book of Revelation, it's in in kind of strange apocalyptic language. But if we put that to one side for a moment, central to this scene are the prayers of the saints. The saints meaning all God's people. And listen to what a couple of commentators say about this. So this is Leon Morris who, who says this, before the angels blow their trumpets, the prayers of the saints are offered. This is not an unrelated parenthesis. John means us to see that the prayers of God's people are supremely important. Even the cataclysmic judgments which follow are held up till these prayers have been offered. Indeed, in a sense, it is these prayers that set the judgments in motion. And then another commentator says this. What are the real master powers behind the world? And what are the deeper secrets of our destiny? Here is the astonishing answer, the prayer of the saints and the fire of God. This means that more potent, more powerful than all the dark and mighty powers let loose in the world, more powerful than anything else, is the power of prayer set ablaze by the fire of God 
and cast upon the earth. Wow. Wow. According to God's word, your prayer is powerful, even when it doesn't feel like it. Every time you cry for God's kingdom to come, every time you cry out for God's power, every time you approach him with a heart that wants to do his will, well, it's like incense rising to him and unleashing power. It's the Bible that tells us that the prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. That's James 5.16. And then 1 John 5.14 says this is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. He hears us. Your prayer is never wasted. You might not get the answer that you want in the timing that you want, but he hears you and your prayer changes you. Your heart changes as you express your dependence on God for all things. So why pray? Well, first of all, because it's powerful and effective. But also, why pray? Well, just look at the world. Just look at the world. What a mess. What an utter mess. We need God. Look at our nation. The, the division, the anger, the hatred, the lack of trust in our leaders. Wow, we must pray. We must pray because Jesus still reigns. He's still on the throne. He is the only hope. He's the light of the world. We live in a nation and a world that is currently crippled and traumatized by fear and anxiety and confusion because of this virus. So we must pray. We must pray for God's kingdom to come. I mean, where else can this nation turn? No human leader has the answers to all the problems we face. We need God. And as the church in this nation, we must stand in the gap. It is, it is down to us to stand in the gap and pray on behalf of our nation and for our nation. And God has given us here at Kings, he's given us a, a, a mission and a vision. We've been called to this town of High Wycombe. God has many people in this place. We've heard that many times before. God has many people in this place. We are ordinary people changed by Jesus to change the world. We're called to be part of spreading the gospel, the good news and the hope of Jesus Christ and seeing the kingdom of God advance in High Wycombe. We are called to become a diverse church of thousands that surrounds and saturates High Wycombe with the love of Jesus. These are things that God has said to us. COVID doesn't change that. It doesn't change the mission. It doesn't change the promises of God. And yet it is so easy to feel overwhelmed and despondent. And we live in a world that's hostile to God, where godless values are promoted, encouraged, even celebrated. And biblical morality is rejected and ridiculed as being old fashioned or bigoted or whatever people want to say. And so the task, the mission, it can start to feel hopeless. It can start to feel impossible. And humanly speaking, we can't reach this world. We can't reach the world ourselves. It needs something supernatural. So we must pray. We must pray. We can only change the world when we go out in the power of the Holy Spirit. So we must pray. We must pray to be filled with God's power. We must pray for God's kingdom to come, for the gospel to advance and for his mission and his vision for us and for this town and for this nation to be fulfilled. Listen to what the Apostle Paul tells Timothy in the book of, in the book of 1 Timothy. He's, he's been talking to Timothy about fighting the good fight and holding on to faith and a good conscience, not shipwrecking his faith by rejecting those things. That's what he's been saying to him. And then at the beginning of chapter two, in 1 Timothy 2, 1, Paul says this to Timothy. He says, I urge then, first of all, that requests, prayers, intercession and thanksgiving be made for everyone. And then he goes on to talk particularly about praying for those in authority. But what Paul is emphasizing to Timothy is that in order to fight the good fight, to do all that God is calling you to do and not be shipwrecked and sidelined and taken out of the game, to, to keep hold of faith, the first thing you have to do of paramount importance that, that I would urge you to do is pray. Is pray, not for yourself, but for others. Why? Well, because prayer is powerful and prayer is effective. And actually prayer... <laughs> Prayer is the most loving thing that we could do for someone else because it recognizes that well, why, while we can help somebody without praying for them, the little good we can do through our limited power is nothing compared to what God can do 
It is the most loving thing we can do for another person to pray for them, to intercede for them, to pray on their behalf and to pray with them if the opportunity arises and to ask God to work for them. Not that you don't then also get involved in their situation, but pray, pray first. So we pray because we trust that God's word assures us that our prayers are powerful and effective. We pray because it's, it's what the world needs more than anything else. We pray because it's the most loving thing we can do for others. But we also pray, and, and, and this is the point that I want to finish with, we also pray because it's a primary means of growing in relationship with God. And, you know, I think Jesus gives us a really a, a great tip about, about prayer, about how to pray throughout the Gospels. Obviously, he gives us the Lord's Prayer. That's quite a big help as well. But throughout the Gospels, Jesus would often talk about being like little children. And so one example is in Luke 10, when the 72 disciples that Jesus had sent out, they all come back very excited and enthusiastic about uh, what had happened on their first missionary journey. And they're saying to Jesus, you know, even the demons submit to us in your name. And Jesus responds with this prayer. He says, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. Jesus is comparing his disciples to little children and and he's delighted that they've become like that. And I think we can apply that to prayer and how we pray. Jesus wants us to come to him like little children because little children just say what they mean. They're uncomplicated. They're honest. Now, I have a vague memory of one of our children when they were very young saying to someone, have you got chicken pox? And the answer was no. And then they said, well, why are there spots all over your face then? And that's the moment where as a parent, you kind of cringe and and apologize. But of course, there's no malice in it at all. It's just a kind of a, a running commentary on life. It's say what you see, complete honesty, a curiosity about things, a sense of wonder about things. And maybe this is what Paul means in Thessalonians when he says, pray without ceasing. You know, that running commentary, that ongoing conversation with God that is interconnected and intertwined with every area of your life. Come to him like little children. Little children are not worried about getting it right. We we sometimes get a bit hung up on how long we pray for, using the right word, doing it in the right way. But prayer is not a performance It's a relationship. It's not a duty. It's a privilege. It's a delight. And we pray as we can, not as we can't. Little children are not afraid to ask for things. I mean, we sometimes think, maybe I shouldn't ask for that. Maybe that's a bit selfish. Should I ask God for that kind of thing? Little children just ask. They just ask. They don't always get, but they ask. Little children, they just come as they are. They're spontaneous. They, you know, they'll, be, they'll be walking along with you and suddenly they'll reach out to hold your hand or they'll jump on you suddenly for a hug. And those, of course, are some of the best moments, the, the greatest joys for parents. Why would we think the, God the Father is any different? Little children hold on to you when they're scared. I remember when my oldest daughter, Anna, used to uh, watch Teletubbies when she was very little. And there was a bit where a lion and a bear would come on and... I would suddenly realise that Anna had edged her way over to me and she was there holding on to my leg because she wasn't sure about this lion and bear business. She didn't really like it, didn't feel safe. She wanted to be close to her dad. But that's how we are to be with our father in heaven, like little children. And little children are not cynical. I talked earlier about what cynicism does to our prayer life. No, little children are not cynical. They, they see things through eyes of wonder. They celebrate small things without question. They observe things. They discover things. They talk about things. They question things. They ask for things. They trust. They trust. And, you know, it must have been what life was like for Adam before sin came in. I was thinking about this the other day. Adam would have had God always by his side, his, his constant companion, constant communion with God and discovering new things all the time with a sense of wonder and just talking to God about it, like saying, look at that. Look at that. What is that? I've never seen one of those before. I'm going to call it a giraffe. Is that, is that OK with you? Yes, son, that's absolutely fine with me. You know what? I'm just enjoying watching you. Whoa, look at that over there. There's another new thing over there. Come and have a look at this. I know, son. I know it's all good. I made it. It's all good. But here, I'm really going to blow your mind now. I'm just going to put you to sleep for a bit while I make something else. 
Now, wake up and look at this. Wow, what is that? And you know, that is the kind of relationship I want with God. Always talking, always asking, always wondering, always discovering, always with him, like a little child and his father. But this is why the gospel is so good, because what was marred, what was ruined, what was broken has been reversed through the death and resurrection of Jesus. He came to restore what was lost. He came to restore that relationship with our heavenly father. He came to make it possible for us to approach God like little children, to enjoy God like Adam did. In Christ, we are no longer slaves to sin. That barrier has been removed. Praise God. The gospel is good news. That means that we can look at our cynicism and actually see how ridiculous it is. It's good news that means that prayer, when we pray, it's a moment of incarnation of God with us involved in every detail of my life. You know, we tend to focus on the inadequacies of our prayers and then we give up too easily thinking there's just something wrong with us. But God, he looks at the adequacy of his son and he delights in our feeble, shaky, helpless, meandering and distracted prayers. So why pray? Why pray? Well, because our prayers are powerful and effective, because our world needs our prayer, because God has given us a mission here at King's that we can't do on our own, and because prayer is relationship with God. It is as much about being as doing. So let me encourage you to continue to develop rhythms of prayer in your life. Take up this prayer challenge, be involved in it, And be expectant to hear God this week. Join us this evening for our online prayer gathering. And let's remember to come to him like little children, full of trust, full of wonder, no pretense. Just come as you are, utterly dependent on him every minute of the day and in every detail of your life.